I'm going to talk on the topic abstractions of a managed streaming platform, and I'm also going to talk about how we are doing that at scale in Flipkart. Uh, before we, I get into that, let me tell you a bit about myself. I am a senior architect at Flipkart with about 10 years of industry experience. I love solving deep, complex problems. Uh, I am a conference traveler. I just love attending and presenting in conferences. I think conferences are great energy and a great learning place. Coming to the agenda for today. So to start with, I will be uh, presenting some use cases and examples to help you guys build an intuition on what stream processing is all about. I will take some of the examples that we have at Flipkart and use that to explain to you guys. Then I'm going to talk about why do we require a stream platform? You know, these are different independent jobs. Why do we require a platform around it? What, is the, what are the characteristics of a platform need, uh, needs to be so that, uh, and, and why do we require that? Then I'm going to introduce Fstream, which is our in-house uh, managed stateful stream processing platform. Uh, mind it that it's a closed source project right now. So uh, today the idea is to present intuitions and abstractions that we feel that are important. At some point in time, it will uh, get into the open, uh, open source community for people to uh, you know, use. And finally, I'm going to talk about the architecture, components, and the various things that we have thought uh, and built while, uh, while solving the stream processing problem. So what are the different use cases? Let me uh, tell you about some of the use cases in Flipkart that we have. How many of you guys have bought something in a flash sale? Raise of hands. Yeah, quite a bit. How many of I'm pretty sure using flash sales is pretty hard, right? Uh, Flipkart actually was the first company that did flash sales in India, uh, 2014. Uh, I was part of the team that did flash sales the first time. And we realized this after flash sales that it is, it is a lot more complicated, not just for the users, but also for the internal users of Flipkart of how a flash sale needs to be done. What are the things to be measured? One of the, one of the things that came across was the flash sale happens so quickly the inventories get over so quickly that it's very difficult for analysts to go uh, to understand what really happened. Typically at that point in time, we had like a batch processing system. So by next day, some of the uh, metrics would start coming in. And we realized that we would burn a lot more than expected, right? So therefore, we required a system which could actually process the data in stream and give a very real, a near real time pro, uh, information to uh, people like uh, analysts. Uh, uh, who can, who want to you know uh, uh, plan how a fulfillment looks should look like you know uh, if if uh, uh, if the sale has really uh, gone well then maybe temper down the next uh, next bit of sales so that you know we could protect our burn protect supply chain all right another example is of trending products you know typically buying is a very psychological behavior we like to buy things that others are buying right we want to know what others are doing. Another example of stream processing use case is that of trending products. What we have done is that we, we collect information from various people uh, buying on Flipkart and use that in a near real time manner to tell the user, as a new user has come in, to tell what people are buying and therefore what is trending on the, uh, on the website. Right? This again requires a lot of near real time processing of data so that we could actually surface this information back to the users who are trying, who have, who have just come in. Right? So this again is an example of near real time processing of data that needs to be consumed. It will be browsing behavior, uh, purchasing data. Yet another example is sort of search auto suggest. So if you, if you typically go on a website and you know this example, you type ni, right? Depending upon what is the, in, uh, uh, what is the most popular search uh, result match, it will either give you a Nikon camera or a Nike shoe, depends upon you know, what is trending at that time. But if we know what the intent of the user is, if he has, say, previously shown an intent to, to you know, actually uh, look for a shoe, then when you type N, it makes more sense to show him uh, Nike instead of Nikon. Right? Now, how do we do that? For that, it means that we have to process his session information, his session behavior, because across sessions, you know, it could be few hours, uh, few hours apart or few days apart, we might have lost the context. So within a session, it means that we have to actually process that information and use that to augment his search results. And therefore, give him a much more personalized search query uh, uh, versus other. So actually, we, uh, today in Flipkart, if you type, uh, type something like NI, you, get, you will get a personalized uh, search uh, result experience most of the times. Right? So this is another example where you require to process data in a near real time manner within the session context and use that. There are other examples also, uh, 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 for example, uh, reseller fraud detection, or, uh, 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 <coughs> search ranking improvements, some of the other examples that requires 
I'll not go into the depth of it, but I, I'm hoping that you have, by now you have gotten an intuition of what, what is why do we require real-time processing for solving various business use cases. Today in Flipkart, we have about 500 plus uh, jobs that are processing at a peak throughput of 400k per second, and solving a bunch of business use cases that otherwise before was not possible. Now, if you if you go back to the use cases that I talked about, what does it mean? for processing. It means, uh, let me take back you to the uh, flash sale example, right? So here we were trying to process order data. Now order data needs to be grouped by category or product for, for the, so that the supply chain analyst who's looking into it can get the data for a particular product whose flash sale has just gone by. You also need to create time windowed aggregates because now you're trying to get this information and put that in a time windowed bucket and aggregating the number of, say, number of orders for that particular product. And then uh, 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 pushing that to a reporting database from which, you know, report visualizations can be created. Similarly, for the uh, trending products example, you are, you are looking into browse events, grouping them by category because now you want to show the same category uh, results of a trending product to another user, right? And then again, you require time window aggregates because you want to factor in whatever is the current or the most recent time uh, times, uh, I mean, time windows in which the that the trend has gone up, right? Uh, 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 for the older time window, the data is no longer relevant, right? So again, you need like a time window aggregate and uh, you then you possibly need to uh, 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 sync that down to some uh, trending database, right? So if you see some of, these are some of the compute paradigms that are required. You need to join, you need time windows, you need aggregations, you need transformations, writing to some external things. And over the course of the talk, I'll explain to you how built on these primitives, we built up our uh, stream processing platform. Yeah, so this is what I talked about, right? Now, why do we require a platform? These could be independent jobs that could be written by different people. Why do we require a platform? So typically, for stream platform, uh, uh, stream processing, the entry bar is pretty high. A uh, lot of domain expertise is needed uh, because unlike uh, batch processing, which has really matured, stream processing is still, uh, is still new and it requires a lot of uh, uh, understanding of, uh, of, of, you know, how, pro of how data will be processed. And, and in some of the uh, more uh, future example, uh, examples, I'll take you why that entry bar is high. It requires uh, complex stateful operators. You need time windows. You need state management because you need to now start uh, uh, understanding when was, the, uh, when was the data arrived, uh, uh, what is the window size, and all that. And then you and store that information to, to be able to process it. And you're doing it at a high scale. Uh, let me tell you through an example why stateful operations are, are difficult and, um, and, and why the entry bar is so high. So typically, as events are happening, there are two uh, notions of time uh, that you would, you would have. There is something called an event time, that is the time at which the event actually occurred. And then there is a notion of a processing time, the time at which, at which you actually process the event. In an ideal world, time, uh, event time and processing time is equal, but that is not true. Processing time is typically way, uh, is typically uh, skewed uh, than the event time. And that could be because of processing delays, it could be because of uh, event failures, um, uh, network, network failures and so on and so forth, right? So typically your processing time skews and therefore you are either get, uh, de uh, getting late data or out of order data, right? And, that, and that's why you need to now start remembering state so, so as to be able to process that. Yeah, uh, again, infrastructure management is hard. Uh, you have to manage compute, you have to manage storage, uh, you, uh, and, and, then, uh, and then expecting everyone in the company to not focus on the business problem, but then fo fo focusing on this defeats the purpose of, of uh, doing, the, uh, doing it in the first place. Uh, finally, housekeeping is also hard. You require metrics, you require alerting, you, you require a job configuration, job management, and all the bells and whistles around managing this so that it becomes easy for a person, for a developer, for an analyst to just write the job, focus on the business uh, business computation, and then let the platform handle it, right? So in our opinion, we felt uh, that for an ideal streaming platform, uh, these are the six pivots that are really required. You need a good programming model. You need uh, stateful operations. You want to lower the entry bar. You want infrastructure management, monitoring, alerting, and job lifecycle management. So these are the six pivots on which we uh, started thinking about a platform, but then there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of open source alternatives, right? So why cannot we use some of them? And I'll explain to you what 
you know what uh, what our analysis was and I'll take you through this. So storm is pretty, uh, typ um, uh, is typically the first uh, stream generation stream processing engine that got built in 2011. It had the concept of a sprout bolt, uh, uh, a master node, uh, zookeepers to manage uh, to manage uh, the computation state. I'll not go into the uh, the architecture of uh, Storm, but I'll explain from the uh, from the pivots that we had created to explain Storm and how uh, and what it what it fulfills, what it did not fulfill. So it lowered the entry bar because now you could actually start just writing uh, some spouts and bolts, stitching them up, and then being able to deploy your job. You could test the job in your uh, in your uh, local environment by uh, by pointing to your uh, config uh, product configurations and and that helped developers move faster. There was some sort of mon uh, monitoring because you could have a uh, user. Storm has a user interface on which you can actually see how the jobs are performing, what is a, uh, what is the throughput, a lot of uh, how many spouts are running, how many bolts are running, and so on and so forth. So it had some sort of monitoring. Of course, there's no alerting around it. And it also had a job life cycle because you could actually now deploy the job somewhere, uh, kill it uh, from the UI, right? So it had some some job life cycle management. But then it did not do in any infrastructure. You had to manage infrastructure on your own. There was no concept of stateful operations. Typically, the state, uh, the typ typically the uh, the information was processed from one spot to another spot, could be to a bolt, and then and then gone. There was no state that was maintained. And there was no programming model around uh, in Storm. There was no concept of how to basically think about computation. It was more in terms of spouts and bolts, which which are uh, which are computing paradigms, but not really a programming model. Then came Spark, which is essentially the next gener uh, second generation uh, stream processing engine. Uh, it had a concept of a executor uh, or a driver, and then a bunch of uh, executors on which the work could be executed. Again, from our uh, pivots of how the ideal streaming platform should be. Uh, apart from lowering the entry bar and life cycle management, I say Spark also had UI very similar to Spark, but much more detailed. Uh, you could see stages and task and, and, and get more information from the UI. So it had monitoring, it had, it had also lowered the bar, but most importantly, Spark came up with a programming model. By that, what I mean is in Spark, you could actually create a computational DAG. You could think of paradigms like map, uh, 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 or a flat map, or a reduce, right? Uh, you could actually write to a sync. So there was a function called write to uh, write as HDFS, or write, uh, or simply write to sync, right? So Spark was the first uh, engine which actually came up with a programming model, right? And with that, it became easy for developers to actually start thinking about data processing in terms of the in terms of the computation that they have. Right in terms of the competition that they want to do, and not in uh, not think in terms of abstract terms like uh, 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 bolts and uh, uh, spouts, right? So that that that, that was, and then finally the re the the coolest the new generation uh, stream processing engine is Flink. Flink does a lot more things, uh, and from our pivot of um, the idle streaming platform, what it really brought to the table was stateful operations. In Flink, every st every compute node has associative state you can actually uh, you can actually store state and then uh, and then do things like trigger you could trigger uh, so you can like wait for a time window and then trigger whenever a time window has reached right it had a much more evolved programming model than what spark offered it had additional constructs not just of map and reduce paradigm but but triggers and late arriving triggers and early uh, early triggers and so on and so forth right so it, its programming model really evolved from what spark really offered uh, with respect to job lifecycle, entry bar, and monitoring, it was there uh, somewhat uh, 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 natively, but not not done a lot, right? They focused mostly on stateful operations and programming model. And finally, there was no infrastructure management, so you had to do that on your own, right? So these are typi these are typically the uh, these are typically the options that are available in the market right now. And if you have to think of a new streaming platform, you can choose any one of them, but then they have their own problem sets. None of them offers everything that you want your platform to be. And that is why we thought that we need to build something which is, uh, which provides a higher level abstraction than what uh, Flink or Spark or uh, Storm is providing. And for that, we came up with Fstream, which is our in-house managed state streaming platform. Uh, so I'll talk to you about, uh, from the same lens of, uh, same pivot that I have been talking about. Uh, but before that, let me tell you a brief about the architecture of Fstream. In the core of it, there is stream processing which has a programming model around how to map, filter, group by, dedupe, 
So we have created additional constructs around dedupe, um, aggregations, join, joining of streams, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth, right? Um, we natively connect to multiple sources. It could be uh, Kafka uh, for uh, streaming, or it could even be HDFS or Hive for uh, for loading the same job that you've written via some batch. And I'll, I'll soon get into that. Then a bunch of syncs to which the data could be written to. It connects to an execution engine, so um, you can plug and play, um, plug in and play, uh, plug out your execution engine. So you have Spark. If, if for a particular use case you don't want to use Spark, but use Flink, so you, you can plug in and plug out Spark with Flink, right? Uh, it we have our own state store which we manage externally. Uh, it's done via HBase. Um, you can also make, uh, you can also plug in your own state store uh, simply by you know extending our interfaces. Uh, it has a job repository with which you can manage jobs. Uh, so you can manage configurations, you can manage file, think about the versioning of it, and so on and so forth. Right? So that at a high level, this is the uh, S3 architecture. Uh, I'll walk through each of the pivots and what uh, and what in our mind we thought of are the right constructs for offering it to our customers who are basically writing stream processing jobs. Right? So uh, as I talked about, there are a bunch of operators. They 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 connect from a, a source and they write to a sync. Right, that essence, that in essence is our programming model. Uh, all the interfaces are pluggable, so you can plug in, uh, uh, plug in a sync, plug a, or you know, uh, a different implementations tomorrow. If you want to write some data to Redis, you can just uh, implement the Redis sync, and 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 that's done. Rest of the rest of the code does not change. It supports internal checkpointing. Typically in Spark or in even Flip, uh, even Flink, checkpoint is maintained internally. So if your code changes. It has to be it has to be managed uh, by you by the person who's writing the job. In in Fstream, uh, we have improved upon that by the platform internally doing a checkpoint. So we maintain our own uh, checkpointed state, and then whenever uh, the job uh, with whatever code with whatever version of code is restarted, it, it remembers the the last offsets or the last uh, checkpoint from which it, it had previously uh, read, and then it restarts from that, right? For the things uh, these things are typically terminal outputs. Uh, that is what it uh, uh, notifies that it's at the end of the program. Uh, the interfaces are all pluggable, uh, and you can also uh, uh, do change notifications by writing uh, by uh, using our change notification uh, APIs. Then there are a bunch. Of, uh, so this was source and that uh, and the sync. In between, there are a bunch of operators, and the and the operators could actually be written in a fluent style. You can you can on your stream do stream dot map and then do uh, join. With join, you get uh, uh, you have logged into another stream, and then you can do possibly a group by, and then write to sync. So you you are basically describing the computation in in a fluent style, and then plugging in uh, and and then plugging in the operator which you feel is the right operator for your stream processing uh, job computation. So I talked about join, and I'll deep dive into join and, and explain why joins are typically hard. It's more hard than what you you would think of. In Fstream, so, in, so before we get into that, uh, in, F, uh, in a join scenario, there are two use cases. There could be a stream to stream join. Both the data arriving in stream and then you, and then you want to join. Another use case is table to stream, gene, uh, table to stream join. Uh, there is some static data and you, and you want to join that from the data that is coming in stream. Now in some cases, the joins could have an indefinite window. An example of that, suppose you created an address in 2014, right? And you're trying to order against that address now. So, the, and, and in your stream processing job, you wanted to join the address with order, right? So, if you see the join window is now indefinite, you could you could not have you could not have said that okay, I'll do a five minute join and then that's about it, because you would you would not have the data backs of uh, of the address data right now because that address was actually created in 2014, right? So, we are talking about window join, uh, which is indefinite. Then there is a lot of late arriving data. As I mentioned, network failures, uh, issues around processing, data could arrive later than usual. So you could mean the uh, you could miss the, win uh, the window that you have defined in your join. So we came up with the concept of a mandatory join and a non-mandatory join. And with this, what we were able to uh, what we were able to achieve was a low latency because you could actually process the the data uh, in a very in a in a really low uh, latency manner. You could also go for correctness. So that is the mandatory join. That if the join has not succeeded, then I would not process the data. So that's correctness for you. Then we also introduce the concept of a eventual correctness. If the join is not successful right now, park the event. But whenever the data comes, it could be a late arriving data. 
then process as soon as the data arrives. So that's eventual correctness. And the third bit is process the data right now, but when the join arrives, process it again, right? So that's basically uh, mixing both the low latency and the eventual correctness, right? So these are some, of, and and if you think about it, all this all uh, all these type of joins means that we have to start storing state somewhere. We have to store uh, we have to store the state of the join so that when the event arrives, we could trigger the pending joins, right? So to achieve this, uh, we created a declarative uh, syntax to define join scenarios. Uh, we in internally implemented a stateful stream, a state, uh, state, uh, state stores on which the joins could be done. Now with this, people are able to reuse pipelines. If one person has actually written a, a, a order to address join, and someone now wants to uh, use that, it's it's reusable. The the delayed uh, the delayed joins are uh, are indep are uh, processed by the uh, by the platform inherently, right? So that was join for you. So another complex is uh, another complex operator is the stateful aggregations. Typically, stateful aggregations are done for a particular time window bucket, and it's done on few fields. Think of them as uh, metrics that you want to compute on dimensions that you uh, against which you want the data. An example of that would be if you are visiting the product page, then the metric could be number of product page views. The dimension would be against which category of product. Was it lifestyle or was it electronics? Right. So here, the 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 category becomes the dimension, and the metrics would be product page views. And now you want to compute that in a time window, right? Now to do that, you need to start storing stateful aggregations. You need to remember that okay, I have processed this data, and this data was for a particular time t1. Now, as as long as you're continue receiving the data for that time window t1 bucket, you will keep aggregating that. Uh, 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 keep aggregating that, right? So, for doing this, what you uh, typical the typically the aggregation uh, uh, job will look like. First, you have gotten the data. You have transformed that into a into a into a metric dimension kind of uh, uh, tuple. Then you filter them for uh, for uh, filter them out because you only wanted to process data that are required for the for for, for the um, aggregation that you're interested in. Then you need to do a reduce by because now you're reducing the data for a particular dimension, right? And again, map it back to the uh, to the format in which it could be written to sync. Now all this complexity is taken out by the platform by a simple aggregation operator. The the user just has to do uh, in his job dot aggregate, and all this complexity is reduced. Today in Fstream we power about thousand odd uh, reports. Uh, and about one billion plus events are, are typically what is processed by a platform computing for more than 50 dimensions. So here, so so far we have talked about programming model and we talked about stateful operations. Now, how does Fstream lower the entry bar? So in Fstream, we also built an extensive test suite. With with this, no user has to worry about deploying a software or f figuring out you know how to run this. They can test their job from their IDE. The entire the entire uh, the entire job could actually the entire job could be written and then tested from an, from your local IDE. You don't have to worry about deploying your code anywhere. So all the functional uh, functional uh, and even non uh, non functional not from the scale point of view, but uh, from like for example, if you're using Spark, then it actually brings up the Spark environment in your local IDE, um, runs it, and then uh, and you can uh, you you actually visualize the results after the. Spark, the temporary Spark job environment has been shut down, right? So, so from that point of view, it has become very easy for developers to iterate very quickly. Now they don't have to write the code, ship to production, realize or a staging, realize a bug, then complete the cycle. They do everything on their IDE. Uh, we have got, uh, we have built multiple fault tol uh, tolerance uh, capabilities in the platform. See, f uh, fault can occur because of network, because of infrastructure, data could be corrupted. So we came up with the concepts of Retry topics and sideline topics. So every time your job is processing, and say you are writing the data to a to a sync, or you are doing a lookup from some inter intermediate store, we have built the capability to automatically detect which one is actually a recoverable error and which one is a non-recoverable error. For example, if your stateful store, for example, if you are using HBase, is down temporarily, then the, the the job continues processing, and all such records which fail to be written automatically gets put into a retry queue. So your job does not fail even your H, even if your HBase sync is down. At some point in time, the idea is 
the person who's managing that sync uh, or the HBase cluster will bring that back up and the stream job that you had written will automatically uh, process the records that were pending, right? So no, no manual operations needed for a stream job writer. All he needs, uh, the, fault, the, fa the faults are inherently tolerated by the platform and made available for processing. For unparsable records, wherein basically from which we cannot recover uh, by retries, we have a concept of a sideline topic, wherein the such data gets pushed through a sideline queue and then and then at that point in time, uh, the users are made aware of data being available in a sideline queue, from which the they can take a manual action of figuring out what is prob what is problem with, uh, what is the problem with that data and then uh, uh, pre-process uh, asynchronously. So, so with the extensive test suite and managing uh, fault, we were able to lower the entry bar. Now what do we do for job lifecycle? So we created a concept of a job repository uh, in which jobs could be versioned. We could capture metadata about the job, when it was the last run, who ran it, who is the owner of the job. And with this, we were also able to build a lineage. Because typically in, st in, uh, in stream processing, what will happen is you will process a lot of data, you will push it to say an uh, intermediate message you like Kafka and then another job will probably pick it up and then process a bunch of inf information again. So you kind of create a chain of jobs, right? So with job lineage, you can actually uh, find the lineage of the end output to the initial output by linking all that and we were able to do that because we had the capability of, uh, we built the capability of a job repository where all the metadata could be, could be captured and made available to our users. And then you had to launch kill jobs uh, from uh, um, uh, you know, uh, for the users. Finally, what for monitoring and alerting? So uh, Spark, Flink provides a lot of metrics, but we felt that we wanted more granular metrics around the computation that we are doing. For example, if you are doing a join, you would want to know how many joins have actually failed, how many joins are waiting for retry, right? See, these are some of the metrics that you would want to know. Similarly, you would want to know alerts around has your job gone into a scheduling lag? As in, the job is uh, uh, processing lower than the expected, so it, it's gone into a lag. Uh, was there, um, uh, wa is the latency of processing high, right? So all these metrics are much more granular than what uh, is provided by say Spark or Flink, and that is what we built automatically into the platform. So a user who's writing a stream job, a stream job, he does not worry about creating the metrics that is required for him to, you know, uh, monitor. All that is done internally by the platform and made available to uh, uh, to a dashboard like Grafana where it could be uh, measured, right? So like these are some of the examples of our uh, right uh, job. For example, we have a section for engine, which in this case is say Spark. Then we capture metrics like number of records that were processed, was there a scheduling delay, uh, delay? Then we have specific another section for source. If you're reading, uh, reading data from Kafka. How many have you recorded? Uh, how many have you uh, read? How many have you passed? Failed? Validated? Uh, is, there a, is there a lag in processing from Kafka? For example, if you're from offset Y and the source and the current offset that being the data is being written to by a producer is say X, what is the delta between Y and X, right? So all these metrics are automatically uh, uh, surfaced out to the user. So he, he gets an understanding of what is causing the problem. Is there a Kafka read that's a problem or is, is, is Spark is having a problem and so on and so forth. Like for a join I mentioned, uh, you want to figure out how many joins were successful, how many failed, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, similarly for alerts, uh, some of the alerts that we have, we have built internally is, uh, is there a lag in processing? Did the job fail? How many records are going into a sideline queue or a retry queue? Uh, is there a source lag uh, that is very high? So all these are alerts that we have built and made available out of the box for end users. So this is uh, most of the work that we have done so far. Uh, future, some of the future work revolves around creating a SQL interface for this, right? So today, our, uh, the, the only uh, piece of um, code that someone needs to write is describing the job, right? Uh, which, is, which could be like a, 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 a data flow dot map dot join dot aggregate dot sync. That's the one line of code that people typically write today. But, uh, but we, are trying, we are creating a SQL interface now, so you could actually describe your computation that I described right now via code in SQL, and then that gets, uh, generates code and gets deployed uh, uh, for processing. So, so this will really open up uh, a whole section of users like analysts uh, who are non-tech uh, people who uh, have difficulty in writing, you know, actual code, 
So for them, SQL is a language of choice wherein you can, they can they can they could actually express uh, the the same same streaming computation so that like uh, all your um, and all your data analysts could actually start using this now. Uh, we want to uh, uh, create a, a serverless compute construct around F stream as in essentially uh, being able to automatically scale up and scale down. Uh, we do that today in some uh, in, in some manner, but uh, uh, this is more in terms of how can we scale to really um, uh, spiky loads and then recover from that uh, uh, recover from that automatically, right? Uh, we want to bring in constructs of multi-tenancy. We want to provide isolation and provide isolation guarantees to our different types of users uh, because uh, we have like multiple use cases that are running on platform, and sometimes one use case kind of overwhelms the other. So we want to provide those multi-tenancy guardrails. And then finally, we want to uh, we are working on a, a user interface for the job, job lifecycle manager. Today we have like programmable APIs through which the users interact. Now we want to make it self-serve via user interface for which uh, the same thing that could be done. Yep. So, uh, so from so from all this, I think the key takeaways for you guys would be um, think about the programming model. In a in, in a streaming job, uh, a programming model is very important because that helps g get the clarity of how a job should look like. Uh, you should have a low barrier for entry, no matter who your end customer end user is, be it developers, be it analysts. You should always strive to lower uh, strive to lower the barrier in, uh, for entry for them. Monitoring, alerting, job management, while it may look Trivial is very important because when when things go bad and things do go bad every every time, right? When things do ba go back uh, uh, go bad, the your monitor how robust is your monitoring and alerting? How robust is your job management? Is what will help the users of the platform really like using the platform. Otherwise, you will be spending sleepless cycles, late night cycles from failures. And finally, job management because. To be able to, uh, to be, uh, it gives the users of the platform a very good uh, hands-on uh, experience of, you know, managing the job. They can think about versioning. They can, they can, uh, they can, uh, they can think about how to actually when to onboard and when to kill. All the, these things you don't want to be in the way for 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 uh, for managing that, right? So, uh, so for a stream uh, processing, these are some of the key uh, abstractions that are required uh, for. For, uh, I mean, if you have such use cases in the in the company, that's uh, pretty much it. If you guys have any questions, I'm open to the floor.